All right, and uh, this meeting is being recorded. Wonderful to see uh, all of the folks here. Uh, just a, a polite request from the beginning: if you are able to switch your camera on, then that would be appreciated. And then I can see all of your smiling and happy faces, and it makes me feel good inside because I realise that I'm speaking either to genuine human beings or at least to convincing AI simulations, which is nearly, nearly as good. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, so yes, I'm coming to you here. For, oh, but, but by the way, Manari, can I just ask, um, what time are we expected to wrap up this evening? So I can time myself. You're still muted. We finish at 6 p.m. At least it's a one and a half hour session entirely, Bante. One and a half hours, okay, no yes, problem. But that we could like to have a little time on discussion, if that is all right, Bante, within that or a little after. Thank you. Yes. So please do put some, uh, put some, uh, if you have any questions or anything, please do put them in the chat. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm in Sydney at the moment. Uh, and uh, here it's a, a Saturday evening and I'm coming to you from a place called Parramatta, which is on the traditional land of the Baramadigal people of the Darug Nation and in Australia because we are conscious of the fact that uh, as white people in Australia we dispossessed the uh, native inhabitants of the land so we uh, pay respects to their elders. Uh, and acknowledge their custodianship of the land uh, when maybe we have a, a public event such as this. Okay, so uh, I'm here to talk about renunciation and you hit upon one of the things that people don't like to talk about uh, renunciation so much, especially when speaking with lay people. And look, I'm going to be completely honest. I gave a talk just just last, what was it? What's today? So they said it last night and on the topic of the three kinds of right thought. And I felt that same thing, that it's a bit weird. I feel I've, when I'm talking with lay people to, to talk about renunciation too much, I feel much more comfortable talking about compassion and talking about loving kindness. These things are easy to talk about because everybody likes those things. And when you come to talk about renunciation, you start to, you start to wonder, oh, is this going to uh, turn people off? Are they going to think, are they going to start getting worried? Are they going to start thinking, okay, well, you know, this Buddhism stuff was all right up to a point, but, you know, what does that mean in terms of me and my life and what I'm going to have to do? But as you mentioned, uh, it is, renunciation is not something that is just for the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, but it is a fundamental factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. It's right there in the Noble Eightfold Path. That means that it's for everybody. Um, I remember uh, one time many years ago, I did a blessing uh, a ceremony for a young couple who just got married. And the one of the bride's friends or something like that was uh, drinking. And somebody said, but aren't, aren't you supposed to be a Buddhist? You're not supposed to be drinking. And she just said, oh, that's for the monks. And I'm like, but is it though? <laughs> so sometimes, sometimes it seems to be a little bit like that. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if it's the same in, in Sri Lanka, but when I was uh, living in Thailand, uh, sometimes you certainly get the feeling that rather than actually keeping the precepts, that uh, it's more convenient to give some dana to the monks and then they can keep the precepts for you. And uh, look, you know, I have to say, look, I mean, you can obviously that's not what the Buddha wanted. OK, but at the same time, I mean, at, at least it shows that you've got some respect for for those precepts and you're willing to do something to support it. Right. So it's not in itself. It's not a bad thing, but it's we can do better. You know, we, we can we can we can we can we can we can look more closely at what those things are that we're holding on to and what those things are that we might want to let go of. <clears throat> All right. So <clears throat> if we're going to uh, talk about renunciation, uh, let's begin with the uh, Maha Nekama. So in the story of the Buddha, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with and which I won't go over uh, again, 
But the crux of that story is when uh, the young Siddhartha leaves his home and goes forth and leaves his young wife and newly born son and leaves his parents. And in the Madhya it says, you know, my, my parents wept with tears running down their faces. And so this provides a, like a dramatic paradox, which is at the heart of the story of Buddhism. On the one hand, we teach loving kindness, we teach compassion, we teach respect, and we should take responsibility, we should take care of our families and the people around us. And at the same time, we regard as our ideal a man who apparently didn't do those things, walked out on his family. It's a, it's a challenging story. Now, the point of this story is that it's supposed to be challenging. It's supposed to be troubling. It's supposed to make you look at your life and think, is that, is that right? It's supposed to make you question. And sometimes there are choices to be made where there is no simple or easy answer. Now, from a doctrinal point of view, okay, from a doctrinal point of view, yes, we can give a perfectly straightforward answer to that. The Buddha left home and he aspired to a greater sense of good and a sense of good that surmounted the good that he would have done by staying at home and which enabled so many other people, including his family, to take the path to Nibbana and to overcome suffering. Right? So, so from a doctrinal point of view, that's, you know, we, we have a perfectly satisfying answer. I'm not saying that there's a doctrinal problem here. I'm saying that there's an emotional problem. Right? No matter how much we tell ourselves that, you know, it was justified or we explain it, it there's still something wrenching about that idea. And there should be. That's the point of it. That's the point of a story is to create something dramatic. And if you look at the, at the history of Buddhist storytelling, the, the story of the Buddha's life, or uh, the story of the Buddha's past lives in the Jatakas. You see that this moment is played out again and again and again. And so many times, whenever this story is retold, there's some kind of slight adjustment to it. Maybe, maybe Siddhartha looked back and saw his wife and son before he left, you know. Maybe in one version of the story, uh, she told him, uh, wait till I'm asleep and leave before you go. Yeah. Each version of the story, there's something which is slightly different about it. In one of the versions, which uh, I must admit I'm a little bit partial to, uh, in the, uh, one of the Jataka stories, I can't remember the Jataka story off the top of my head, but one of the Jataka stories, the um, Bodhisattva and the, the lady who uh, was to be his wife, Yashodara, in this life, were married. They were living in a little house and they had a couple of children. And they had a happy family life. And one day they were sitting there over dinner and the uh, Bodhisattva, the husband, says to his wife, my darling, I love you, I love my children, but I feel this yearning for renunciation and I, 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 feel, I feel like I want to go forth. And the wife said to him, well, it's strange that you should say that, my darling, because I also feel this yearning to go forth. And they said, well, given that our children are so young, we'll have to wait for them to grow up before we can do that. And so then a bit later on in the evening, the wife said to the husband, my darling, I'm just going to pop out to the well to draw some water. And she went out to the well and she didn't come back. She went off to become a nun and ordained and practiced, leaving her husband to look after the kids. And so this version of the Jataka story flips the script and he was left raising the kids until they were ready to look after themselves and then he went forth and after he went forth he happened to run into his former wife he says you said you were going to go to the well <laughs> and <laughs> so so that's just one of the variations you see other variations in the jataka stories you know like the where santra jataka where they, the whole family goes forth together or other ones where the whole kingdom will go forth and there's so many different kind of variations to this so there's not like one single answer to it 
but there's always a tension and there should be a tension. That's the point. It's something dynamic and something which is uh, always fertile at the heart of Buddhism because we feel this tension, this pull on the one side towards the world and the pleasures and the delights that the world can give us and on the other side, this spiritual yearning for something beyond, for something more peaceful, for something more free, for something we call Nibbana. Now, that doesn't go away until, until we become an Arahant. Right? That's it. For an Arahant, that question is settled. But until we get there, even if you decide, oh, I'm going to renounce, I'm going to become a monk, well, you look at the verses of someone like Talaputta, for example, who wrote these beautiful verses in the Theragata where he is castigating his own mind and saying, mind, what are you doing? All the time before I was living in the household life and all you could think about was going into the forest and meditating and finding that peace and happiness. And now here I am, I've gone to the forest and I'm happy and I'm meditating and all you can think about is all the going back to the home life and all the things you use to enjoy that. What are you doing, mind? And that's, that's how it is. Even if you're a stream enter or once returner, even a non-returner, in a very subtle level, there's this still subtle sense of unease. This is the udhacha of the, the uh, non-returner that there's still a slight sense of, ah, I've got to get to Nibbana, yeah? I've, I've sort of slight pull towards that. So we might as well get happy with this fact. We might as well, might as well be content with the fact that the pull of the spiritual and the material are going to be there. And we're going to negotiate our lives as best we can, somewhat imperfectly, through this. Now, each of the people who is here are listening to this talk has a different life, different experiences, different values, different priorities, different things that matter to you, different things that, that, that give your life meaning and purpose and value and happiness. And so I, it's not up to me to sit here and to, uh, to give you the answer of to where you should go next or what, what is the, the right amount of renunciation for each one of you. But what I can do is maybe share a few handy tips. Probably the most basic one is that when it comes to renunciation, don't be too over the top. All right. This is something that's kind of it's a kind of a red flag when you're in a monastery. There's a story that uh, my, one of my early teachers, Ajahn Pasano, used to tell. Uh, and this story was from uh, not a Buddhist story, but from the Christian Desert Fathers. They used to have a, like a meditative order. And one day the young acolyte comes to the head priest and says, oh, I want to do a special practice. I'm going to eat, uh, I'm going to have just like um, one loaf of bread every second day. That's my special practice. And so the head priest thought about it for a minute and he said, you know, I'd be happier if you had half a loaf of bread every day. Don't go over the top with the renunciation. Don't think this, oh, I've got to get rid of this and I've got to get rid of this and I've got to do that. A lot of that kind of thinking is fueled by um, restlessness. It's fueled by a sense of, um, uh, like be, so a sense of being unhappy or dissatisfied with oneself. And this kind of feeling of, of that you have to sort of push and push hard to sort of be something else. And so that kind of thinking is uh, something to be wary of. And we find that a lot in monasteries, especially, I would have to say, uh, with young men who come to the monasteries. And the young men who come to the monasteries often are struggling a lot with a lot of sensual desire and a lot of, um, a lot of inner conflict and a lot of uh, sort of uncertainty about who they are and where they want to go in their life. 
and they latch on to this idea of Buddhism and it gives them this kind of strong father figure, this strong uh, sense of value, something they can commit to. And then, some, and, then, and then it can be just pushing, pushing, pushing to get this thing. And then that can, that, that can end up out of balance. And a lot of the times that you see young men like that will flame out. They won't actually last. Not all the time. I mean, look, I was like that when I was a young monk. I tried doing all of these special practices and doing all of these things and pushing myself and so on. And well, here I am. I'm still around. And <laughs> So it's not necessarily that that is going to be bad for everyone, right? But just it's just something to be careful of. Now, as you get older, probably less tendency to do like that. Huh? Um, when you when you get older, you've enjoyed things, you've had the things that you wanted in life, you've achieved things, and you know you've you've tasted the pleasure of those things as well as the pains and the suffering of losing them and the disappointment of the thing that you wanted not giving you necessarily the satisfaction that you thought it would be and so that you know you you sort of it's i think natural as you get older to um not for everyone of course but to have a bit more wisdom around this uh thing of renunciation so rather than sort of pushing through and trying to give up too much all the time then use your wisdom ask yourself what am i holding on to that's giving me suffering and if the if if the question if the answer to that question is something big like my house or my family or something like that then you're probably going to want to say hang on just slow down a little bit ask yourself what is the smallest thing that i can think of that I'm holding on to that's causing me or causing others suffering. The smallest thing. Yeah? And who knows what that might be? I don't know your mind. Maybe it's your uh, addiction to a, a particular show on Netflix. Maybe it's um, a particular kind of cake that you like. Maybe it's whatever. I don't know. It's some small thing. Yeah? And then we can think, okay, well, I'll try giving that up. And so you build up your renunciation muscles like this, just a little bit. And then you see what that's like. Oh, okay. I gave this thing up, and now I have the peace from that. Ah, oh, yeah, that's a piece of that renunciation. <laughs> what now? What would I give up? And then you try, okay, maybe, maybe something else. So by, by doing it as a conscious practice to give up specific things not not the things that you think in your head you should give up but the things that are actually causing you suffering and causing suffering for others this is the important thing yeah so use your mindfulness use your discernment what what's actually a problem not what somebody else says is a problem or what i've read about in a book that says it's a problem but what is actually causing me or causing people I know suffering. And if you don't know what that is, go away and do your meditation. And then when you finish your meditation, ask yourself, huh, what is that thing that I'm holding on to? And when your mind is clear in meditation, very often, then that thing can come to you. Now, sometimes when we renounce things, quite a lot of times when we renounce things, actually, there's no real cost to it. I mean, it might be the thing I'm holding on to is my grudge against my friend for, you know, ghosting me at that dinner we were supposed to have together or something like that. And, you know, you can let go of those things and it doesn't actually cost anything. Or maybe, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's having a, having a, a, a glass of wine with your meal and, you, and you've, for years you've told yourself, well, it's just one glass of wine, that's all right. Doctors say one glass of wine's healthy for you, so yeah, never mind. You think, well, maybe, maybe it's time to say, okay, maybe I don't have that glass of wine, and you give that up, and then you're like, ah, oh, actually, it's fine. Yeah, it's not such a big deal, really. It doesn't really change uh, your happiness in your life. Yeah. So, but then sometimes, 
you'll find that to renounce something uh, actually is hard or hurts. Yeah? What I'm not going to say is that if it's hard to give up, that means that it, you that is better. I'm not saying that harder is going to be better to give up. No, no, no. That's more like a kind of uh, that's a kind of uh, atakilamatana yoga approach. You know, it's like a self mortification approach. If it hurts more, then it's going to be good for me. So don't think like that. Sometimes something might be hard to give up, but actually it's not. It's not. There's not really much point in giving it up. On the other hand, something else might be very easy to give up, but be um, have a lot of a lot of really uh, uh, immediate benefits or really apparent benefits. So don't think so much in terms of what's hard or what's easy or anything like that. Look at the same criteria that the Buddha always looked at, which is, does this give rise to suffering for myself and for others, uh, or does it give rise to happiness for myself and others? A number of years ago, uh, I went to a, uh, a conference in, in Vienna, and, uh, hey, Gitta coming here from Vienna? So this was, <laughs> this was the uh, uh, Religions for Peace uh, conference there. And uh, one of the panels that I went to, um, they, it was on climate change. And they, were, they had a speaker there. I didn't know the speaker. But the speaker uh, began talking. And as soon as he began talking, he immediately uh, mentioned Nekama. Not, not the English word renunciation, the Pali word Nekama. And so when he said Nekama, I thought, ah, oh, yes, I must be a Buddhist. So I was very happy. He was talking about climate change. And he was saying that if we really want to help and we really want to stop destroying our beautiful planet, then we are going to have to take renunciation seriously. This gets to the heart of, a, I think, a massive and a huge issue and an issue with our modern world. We all know that we live in a world that is very unusual. Very unusual. The very fact that we're having a Dhamma talk over Zoom is testament to that. The technologies that we're using didn't exist just a few years ago tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years of human civilization and human human life never had anything even vaguely like this and for uh, almost all of human existence uh, certainly for the last several thousand years people lived much more like uh, what you'll see in a simple village in sri lanka living in small houses, working hard on the fields, living in close-knit communities, maintaining uh, like local customs and knowledge, um, and having, having a much more, much more kind of closed world than the world that we enjoy today. And where all of this prosperity that we're having ultimately comes from uh, technology industry fueled by fossil fuels which creates climate change and creates all of this devastation for the environment so we use these things and we have that uh, happiness from having all of these things but they have a cost and that cost is actually a terrible one What would it be like if we were to look to the future and rather than thinking of a future where we are going to have more and more things, what if we were to look to the future and think of a future where we were to have fewer things, but maybe choose those things a bit more wisely? Maybe if we were to have the things that we need, the things that are really valuable and meaningful in life, rather than just having uh, lots of toys and frippery and all of those kinds of things. Now look, I'm aware that I'm quite likely speaking mostly to the converted here. Probably most of you, I'm guessing, are not living a life of too much frippery and you're not probably going out clubbing in the evening 
and uh, so on. I'm guessing for most of you, maybe maybe some of you when you were younger or whatever. So, uh, again, it's kind of a thing with, with aging as well, that sometimes you get, not all the time, but sometimes you get more, more aware or more content of what you really need. But I think this is something that we, even though we are aware of this, and I don't think I'm really saying anything that you don't already know, but I think even though we're aware of it, we kind of forget. One of the things that I think of uh, a lot, it's, you know, you know, sometimes it's the really small things in your life that really matter. I don't know. People like people say that people say that our oh, young people are really care about the environment and all of these kinds of things. OK. But, you know, one of the first environmental lessons I got was from my grandmother. And when I was uh, when I was a boy, my sister and I would go and stay at our grandparents' place and stay the weekend or something like that. And uh, you know, those days in my teens, I started shaving. And when I just started shaving, and then I had a uh, disposable razor, I didn't even think twice about it. And when my grandmother saw that I had this disposable razor. She just looked at it and said, oh, I don't like those things. They're too wasteful. Amazing, right? Amazing. Like she'd grown up, I mean, you know, she'd grown up in a, in, through the war and these kinds of things, but that was a long time ago. I mean, she was a fairly affluent woman, you know, living in a nice house and so on. She wasn't like a, you know, someone living in poverty or anything like that. And yet... For her, to have a disposable razor was just, she didn't like it. It was wasteful. So a lot of these things that we're talking about, I think and they're, not, they're not things that we're discovering or things that kind of, uh, you know, oh, we should recycle things, oh, we should not, not be wasteful and all of these things. This is actually the way that everybody lived. This is just normal. It's normal to have moderation. It's normal to accept the limits of what we can have and consume. It's normal to understand that there are consequences to having too much. I mean, we learned this from our mums when we were kids, you know. Don't eat all the birthday cake, it'll make you sick. And so <laughs> myself, of course, being someone who was a, from a young age, a proponent of the scientific method, proceeded to test my mother's assertions and eat all the birthday cake. And yes, indeed, it was true. It did make me sick. So thanks, mum. Yes, that was, a, that was definitely a testable hypothesis there. And these things actually are so straightforward and so normal, and yet we seem to have forgotten those. I think it's fundamental to, to be honest, to any sort of religion. I mean, we're speaking in a Buddhist context here, but I think in a Christian or Muslim or Hindu context, I think it would be the same thing. You know, I think that there's always a sense that the material world is something that, you know, is there to be enjoyed in moderation and, there to, and an acceptance of the limits of that and an acknowledgement that what really gives life meaning is something which is beyond that, something which is higher and better than just enjoying the material world. And I think it's only in modern times that that idea has gone out of fashion, and it's gone out of fashion because the material nature of society has changed, because of industrialization, because of limitless very cheap energy we can make the things that we want and we can power our economy uh, by literally digging up fossil fuels burning them and driving machines which will make the things that we want and so we can live in this kind of bubble or illusion that somehow we're going to be able to solve all the problems with just more technology and more industry better industry better technology better products in a recent election in Australia, one of the political parties had this slogan, uh, tech not taxes. And talking about climate change, they said tech not taxes. I mean, that political party was 
the Australia was the like literal worst in the world on its action on climate change at that point. So uh, there's <laughs> you can judge their sincerity from that. But tech, what what tech not taxes mean? So think about it. So sort of slow down and think what that means. What that means is that there's more trust in machines than there is in humanity. That's what it means. Tech means machines. Taxes means people will pay to governments to be for people to work together to find solutions. That's what taxes means. That's we, we benefit from taxes all the time because that's how people use taxes. And so when they say this, this, this is such a huge underlying um, thing in the world today that people believe in machines and they don't believe in people. You know, you look at AI, it's the same thing. People are like, oh, you can do all these things with AI, you can do this and you can do that. Well, people can do those things as well. <laughs> Why? <laughs> but people believe in AI. And we've lost faith in humanity. Yeah. But I can tell you what, we can argue all we like about uh, AI and its capabilities and ChatGPT and all of these kinds of things. But... There's no AI that's going off and meditating. There's no chat GPT getting into jhanas. I can tell you that much. They don't have any inner life. They don't have any experience. There's nothing going on inside. It's just mashing words together in a, in a form that we find convincing. That's all there is to it. But we, as human beings and as sentient beings, have an inner life there is something inside us when we talk about like the middle way and about renunciation and about letting go you know partly we can talk about it in that in in a kind of instrumental way you know like it achieves some kind of goal we do it because, oh, yes, I can see this addiction is bad for me or this habit is bad for me. And if I let go, then it's going to be good for me. And we can look at it in terms of cause and effect in this instrumental way. We can we can apply that same logic uh, on a social level or, or, or economic level or an environmental level. And the same thing can apply. But I think that there's something left over once you've done that. I think there's something more to it. Because it, it, it ultimately comes down to like, what kind of person that you are. It comes down to like, what, does, what does your humanity mean? And we live in this world where there are people of all different kinds. And right on this call we have people from different backgrounds, different ages, different experiences, different beliefs, different genders, different sexualities. All of these things are variable and changing. And, but underneath, we share something in common. The Buddha would say that what we share in common is our capacity to experience suffering, to understand that suffering, and to let go of that suffering. And this is the Four Noble Truths. And through letting go of suffering, we can transcend the limits that we impose ourselves on ourselves as human beings. So this is where uh, renunciation ultimately fits in with the Noble Eightfold Path. Right? So renunciation has certain specific limited aims, but it also has a greater aim which, which makes you more free when I again, when I was a young monk in Thailand, so that I was in the Thai forest tradition, and the Thai forest tradition emphasised uh, doing uh, what they call uh, tudong practices or dutanga practices in Pali, which would be undertaking various kind of ascetic practices, and these are regarded as kind of optional uh, practices for uh, for monks and nuns. Uh, some of them uh, would be like, say, taking one meal a day or uh, eating only the food that you go you receive on Bindabata, or um, uh, some some might be a bit more challenging than that. One might be like, uh, say, sleeping at the root of a tree, 
uh, and so on. So there's these different uh, ascetic practices uh, which people could do. And that, well, the way that they were taught in Thailand, it was always like, oh, this is a way of, uh, con you know, constraining your defilements. They would use the word toraman gilet, which means uh, to literally to like to uh, torment your torment your defilements. And this is how you can, you know, burn up those uh, desires and weaknesses that you might have. And that's certainly one aspect of these practices. But I was quite surprised when I read the uh, Visuddhimagga account of those same practices. And I discovered that in the Visuddhimagga, uh, a lot of the emphasis was about freedom. It wasn't just, you know, you eat one meal a day because that will teach you to control your hunger. It's eat one meal a day because then the rest of your day is free. And you can do what you want with it. And it wasn't that, you know, so, so uh, uh, another one might be, say, to, to not accept invitations to eat uh, in people's houses. And in Thailand, they would say, oh, that's because you get, that's where you get all the best food when you get an invitation to eat in someone's house. Uh, so, uh, but, but the actual reason was saying that, well, if you don't do that, then in the Wasudi Maga, it said, if you don't do that, then you're free from having to keep appointments and your, your day is more open and you can enjoy that by meditating and spending that time in peace. And so for each of these, Tudong practices, the Wisudi Manga pointed out that it was actually because it led to peace and to freedom. I thought that was really lovely and it was a way of looking at these things which was new for me at the time. So when we're practicing renunciation, then this is something always to keep in mind. How is this going to make me more free? This is how it fits in with the Noble Eightfold Path. Eh? This is your right view. How is this going to make me more free? To understand, ah, oh, I can let go of this thing. Ah, I'm going to be free from having to do that. Yeah. And maybe what it, may, that freedom can manifest in different ways. It might mean that you have more time. It might mean if you're not spending money on things, maybe you have less financial worries. You know, maybe you have more time to spend with your family. Who knows? It could be so many different things. So we think about what can we let go of that's going to lead us suffering and what is it that can open us to more freedom. And that freedom, right, so the renunciation leads to freedom, then gives us the opportunity to further develop our spiritual practice and to build on that uh, through developing other factors of the Eightfold Path as well. So one of the things that the kind of the modern world has done to us, it's not only it's not only convinced us that greed is good. Well, I don't know if it hasn't convinced us. It's convinced a lot of people that greed is good. And it's convinced a lot of people that pursuit of more, more, more is going to be better. Years ago in Sydney, I saw a Porsche driving by with a, a bumper sticker. And the bumper sticker said, uh, whoever dies with more toys wins. <laughs> this is how people think. Die with more toys, you win. So this has convinced us to think in this way. This is a diminishing of our humanity. This is becoming less than what we could be. And we're becoming trapped in this way of thinking that is just making us, making us delight in something kind of silly and kind of menial, and something that doesn't really bring us a lot of joy. And that is how we get entrapped. And often this entrapment is quite conscious. I mean, people like people who are doing advertising, will they're, they're trying to get you entrapped into it. That's the whole point of advertising. A number of years ago, I went for a, a house down, uh, for a house blessing, for a new house for a young, uh, young couple here in Sydney. And um, <clears throat> we were sitting down having the meal and they told me the story because they, they, they had just um, uh, put a uh, mortgage, put, took a mortgage out on their home and got their first home as a young couple, a married couple. Very, very good, right? If you're living in Sydney, you would know how significant that is. Sydney is <laughs> one of the most expensive cities in the world and it's very difficult to, 
for young couples to actually get out, you know, to buy a home of their own. And but, but the story that they told me was this. They said that when they, on the day that they finalized their mortgage, the husband went to work and uh, he told his boss, he said, oh, look, you know, just let you know, good news, we finalized the mortgage on the home. And the boss laughed and said, ah, ha, ha, now we've got you. And then <laughs> he went back and he told his wife this story. And his wife said, you know, my boss told me exactly the same thing. <laughs> so they know this is how you do it. Yeah, this is how you get people trapped with lots of debt, right? Taking out mortgages, all of these things, all of these things are trapping you, right? I mean, that's a huge one. Yeah, owing debt. As soon as you owe debt, yeah, it's difficult. You can't renounce. You can't ordain as a monk or nun until you pay off that debt. Yeah, and so these are ways that people will deliberately trap you and keep you here in samsara. Then we come to define ourselves. We define our success by how much work we can do and how productive we can be. And this, again, is a diminishing of our humanity. There was a really lovely uh, uh, answer given a few years ago by the uh, American politician, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who, if you don't know, was the, I think, the youngest congressperson ever elected. And she was asked what, uh, whether she was concerned about uh, robots creating unemployment and displacing people from their jobs. And her answer was, I think, very profound. She said the real problem is not that robots will displace people from their work, but the, real, but the problem is that we have, we have let ourselves be conditioned to think that our worth comes from our economic output. We have let, it, that's, we have let ourselves be conditioned to thinking that that is what makes us valuable. And that's how we get trapped into this thing. And this is why it seems so hard to escape, because we live in a world where more, more, more is always better. So renunciation steps back and says, well, maybe less, maybe not, maybe, maybe enough, yeah? maybe enough. Maybe you can have the things that you need. And then that's okay. Maybe you don't need to work more. Maybe you don't need to get more. Maybe actually this is enough. So I mentioned before about renunciation starting with small things. And so for all the people on this talk, I just want to remind you in case you might have forgotten, but you're already practicing renunciation by the very fact that you have showed up here. You have renounced all of the other things that you might have been doing. I don't know what those things are. Maybe you have lots of options, maybe you don't. But you renounced all of those things and you came here. No? And you gave your attention to the Dhamma rather than giving your attention to something else. This is your renunciation. This is renunciation that you are already doing. And so this is one of the wonderful and marvelous qualities of the Noble Eightfold Path. The Noble Eightfold Path is not something extra which we have to sort of add into our lives. The Noble Eightfold Path points to how we are already living our life and shows us a way to do that even better, to build on the good qualities of our life while letting go of the bad qualities. So each one here is already practicing renunciation. And so your question is, how do I do this better? How can I let go more? What can I let go of? Sometimes your wisdom will tell you what is the right thing to do. Sometimes you just have to try it out and see. Yeah, you don't really know. You know, and then you can just try and say, okay, I'll just do this for a while and see what, what happens. It's okay. Actually, that's a good thing to do because by that, doing that, you you uh, get you learn you know you learn more about yourself. You you develop your wisdom. So don't think that renunciation is some 
sort of huge hill over there that you can maybe do or don't do. Don't think that it's something for, you know, only going forth as a monastic or not going forth as a monastic. If, if, if that is something that interests you, right, then great, give it a shot. But don't build it up to be too much in your mind. This is another red flag for people who are like aspiring monastics, right? If they if they if they think if they've planned it up too much and they've got too much of an idea and all of these things, it usually doesn't end up being what they think it's going to be. Yena yena himan yanti totang hoti anyata. Whatever you think it's going to be, it turns out to be something else. So. If you if if you're interested, just go try staying in a monastery. That's all. No big deal. Most of us have got a place that we can go to and just to stay for a while. In Sydney, we can go and stay at Santi Monastery, or we can go up to what Buddha Dhamma, or maybe to the Katumba Vihara and stay for a little while. Think, oh, okay, just for a few days, come back. How was that? Go again, come back. Try that a few times. If that's something that you like. Maybe talk to the community. Say, look, I'm, I'm thinking maybe of ordaining or something like that. What, what do you think? And discuss it and maybe sort of think about the steps that you might want to take towards that. Maybe start simplifying your life or talk with your family and friends about it and so on. If it's going to happen, then, you know, you'll, you'll find a way. And this is something that the Sangha has been doing for two and a half thousand years you know providing that opportunity for new members to come to provide ordaining provide ordination ordaining bhikkhunis ordaining bhikkhus and to accept it's always a joyous occasion when we can accept somebody into the sangha who has made that decisive step to renounce their home life and to live in the way uh, uh, exemplified by the buddha but that's not for everyone so if that's for you, then try it and see. If it's not for you, then within the path that you have, then see what you can do to let go. Don't be strange, okay? Don't be weird about it and don't try to push things too much. Sometimes people do things and you're like, nah. For example, one thing that people try to do sometimes is that they, they're living at home and they're like, oh, I'm going to take eight precepts. I'm living at home. I'm not going to have any dinner when my family has dinner. I'm like, okay, if you want, I want to have dinner, it's all right. But that's not really what the eight precepts were for. The eight precepts were meant for once a week on the oppositor that you would take those special vows and you do some meditation and listen to Dhamma. And, you know, that's how it was meant for, not for living in the home every day. That's what the five precepts are. So look, maybe it's going to work for you, but don't let it become uncomfortable or strange. Yeah, just 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 be natural. You know, this is something that in in our tradition, uh, Thai forest tradition, Ajahn Chah was always trying to tell people just just be natural. You know, if you're doing walking meditation, just walk naturally. If you or everything that you're doing, let let the Dhamma be part of you. One of the stories that I heard uh, about Ajahn Chah was when he was with, with one of the young monks and they were, I can't remember what they were doing, they were just going, going for a walk through the forest or something like that. And the young monk said to Ajahn Chah, he said, you know, Ajahn, he said, it's so hard this life. And Ajahn Chah just laughed and said, what do you mean it's hard? <laughs> Here we are walking through this beautiful forest, having this lovely time together. There's nothing hard about it. This is just a, it's just beautiful. It's lovely and peaceful. Why, why are you making it something hard? So don't make renunciation something hard. It should be beautiful. It should be light. It should be something which is joyous. Yeah? And when you give things up, it should be joyous. Maybe, maybe it's a bit of struggle in the beginning, but it should feel good. It should feel light, and your heart should feel light afterwards. And so this is that. That 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 um, that emotion of renunciation, which it always brings, like in the suttas, when it says, uh, talks about the um, whenever uh, a young man or woman uh, uh, leaves home to take the uh, yellow robe, that the devas will rejoice, and they'll sprinkle the flowers of the divine coral tree, and 
this singing and dancing and celebration among the devas. And that is really the quality of renunciation. So don't make it something hard and don't make it something that's like really opinionated. It has to be like this or it has to be like that. Just try it out and see and let it be something that matures in your wisdom and in your experience. So this is just a few thoughts for you today on the topic of renunciation and particularly in the context of Buddhism renunciation in the lay life, renunciation for those considering perhaps the monastic life, um, but also renunciation in a more social sense in terms of uh, climate change and caring for the environment, because renunciation, you know, what, what we have and what we want is deeply conditioned by what others have and what, what they want and the people around us. So we are, I believe, you know, living in this time where more than ever, more than ever before, we are being spurred to want and to have more, which makes the virtue of renunciation even more meaningful and even more powerful. And I think this is something that each one of us can consider in our own lives, not just renunciation for our own good, but also because of setting an example for those around us, setting an example for our family, for our neighbors, for our friends, for people at our work, for our children, just to, to show the possibility of the lightness of living a life of contentment and ease. So I'll, I will finish there for now. Maybe we can have some questions, if we have any questions, uh, or what do you think? Thank you very much, Bhante. That was a wonderful wonderful bit of uh, time spent realizing really to get rid of things that weigh us down and to find more ease and freedom thank mm -hmm. you so much and that climate change being brought into it environmental issues was amazing i'd like to i think i'm sure there are questions from the floor we, we don't have anything in chat just yet did, did you have any questions? I haven't got any here. Um, you were taking notes, though. <laughs> I have a question and a comment, Bante, uh, if I may, Dr. Manori. Yes, go ahead, oh, Nadisha. Nadisha. Thank you so much, uh, Bante. That was a very, very valuable speech. Um, you cleared, clarified very much what renunciation means, um, especially in our modern life. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I will keep in mind that renunciation means letting go things you can in a way. Initially, it might be a struggle, but to understand whether I have let go of the right thing, I should feel peaceful and happy and joyful. Um, and listening to a sermon like this is also renunciation. You're absolutely right. Um, um, I was here today to take notes uh, for Dr. Manori to help her. Um, and what I gave up was my Saturday afternoon nap. And it's absolute yeah. renunciation for me. That was a hard thing to do. Um, <laughs> and, and listening to you, Bante, I was so happy. And I'm, I'm grateful to Dr. Manori for uh, pushing me to do that. Um, and this is one thing I, I made a firm determination. I'll renounce every Saturday to do because it's so valuable. Um, when you're talking about climate and all and you and, and a grandmother, your grandmother, I remember what my grandmother, mm -hmm. she lived in a village with a lot of paddy fields. Okay. And one day I saw her um, picking up a few rice grains that had fallen on the floor while taking rice out of a pot for cooking. Mm -hmm. And I asked her grandmother, why aren't you just sweeping it away? And she said, if you have any idea about the people who put so much effort to get this each rice seed, you will never just sweep it away. You will pick one by one like me and put it into good use. She said it's all about respecting nature and respecting the people who created this right thing. So mm -hmm. I, I thought as a child, I was seven or eight years old. I thought she was nuts, honestly. <laughs> now listening to you, I understand the, the wisdom behind that. So thank you, Bantu. 
Oh, thank you so much for that story. That's a, that's a really beautiful story. I'll, I'll definitely remember that. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll probably tell it at some talks in the future. Because that, to me, I mean, that's, that's just so, that's just so true, you know, like, like my, so that was my, my grandmother, but my, my grandmother on that, that's on my grandmother on my mother's side, my grandmother on my father's side, raised my father see like we live in australia you know we get so you know used to being here in a wealthy country and so on but my father grew up in a in a town on the edge of the desert in wa there was like half a dozen families in the town and it was absolutely dirt poor and my his father sorry his mother raised a family of four kids as a single mother teaching as a local teacher in the local school where there was one kid in every year in the school and that's all there were and just on the air, literally on the edge of the desert so you, and it's just and my, my dad like my dad was, I was talking with my dad about it the other you know not long ago and he said he said he never thought about it when he was a kid but he's, he's got no idea how she managed to do that <laughs> with so little and you know but they never they never went without they like he, if to him it wasn't a deprived childhood or anything that was just his life and uh i think we we kind of get used to this way of being and we, we forget that actually this is so unusual for humanity and most people live in a life that is so much simpler and it's okay it really is you don't have to have all the things that you want it's really okay Anyway, thanks for that. We should take a couple more questions. I think Don set his hand up. Thank you, Bhante. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, and also for bringing in climate change into the discussion. As a former senior official of the United Nations Environment Program, I was really heartened by what you said. But let me just get to the to what I wanted to highlight briefly, and I'll keep it short. I wonder if the word renunciation is the right translation for nekama. Okay. The etymology comes from renunciare, which tends okay. to mean sort of a, involves a proclamation kind of thing, where you okay. renounce the world and then you go into some corner or some quiet place and then yeah. or some cave and then you totally cut yourself off from okay. the world that's the sort of perception which i'm getting okay so when you look at the buddha and the sangha now and then before the buddha was although he renounced he was heavily engaged in society Sure. And in societal issues. So I'm just wondering whether the term ought to be in English non-attachment or liberation or emancipation. <laughs> loved, loved, and by the way, thank you so much for the for Sutta Central. I, I practically live there most of the time. Oh, really? Oh, very good. Excellent. Oh, well, Don, thanks, thanks for uh, that feedback. And I didn't know about that with your, your work with the United Nations. So thanks for doing that, that, that work there. I'd like to talk to you more about it at some time, point. But anyway, just to come back to your point on renunciation, I never, honestly, I never really thought about that. You said like the etymology. So I guess, I guess renounce is probably from the same root as announce in that sense, right? Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. And re is the opposite of it. Yeah. So renounce is to say I'm going to like you're making a statement about it. Yeah. Um, the book, the problem with with translation, like, you you know, you mentioned a bunch of words, which are, you know, certainly within the, the right uh, semantic sphere. But of course, they're all used for other things. So when you're translating the suttas, then there are there are many words for for this kind of things. Like, let's say we're like attachment and non attachment, freedom, liberation. Actually, there are, you know, bunches of words in Pali, all with yeah, slight shades of meaning of differences so we try to keep these things as distinct as possible um i'm not sure i'll have a think about it i know you know that's renunciation has become such a um such a standard rendering for nekama that i've not really given it a lot of thought 
um, but maybe there's a maybe there's a better choice. Um, renunciation, renunciation. Um, well, let me think about it. Yeah. So the just <laughs> just to follow up, the inclination you get or the perception you get with you're the first person that I have heard of who has brought renunciation down to earth. Okay. In the sense of renunciation of doing things in the here and now. Yeah. Renunciation with climate change, renunciation in terms of personal small choices. Mm. Because what we hear often is the Buddha renounced the renounced. So there was in many ways a feeling that someone has renounced and then gone away somewhere. Right, yeah. And said goodbye to the world. Yeah. So I'm I'm struggling with it, and hopefully there might be a better term that would really bring this important concept of renunciation, which really, to me, means sustainable living. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, into focus. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll I'll, I'll take that away, and I'll, I'll have a think about it. Nothing comes to mind yet, but uh, this, these are all good points. Um, there's a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Shall I take those yes, questions? Yes, please. Somebody else has their hands on. Uh, okay, so Neville asks, in the context of the emotional response to the Buddha abandoning his family, given that we have the teachings, do we need the Buddha? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're getting at there, but perhaps... Um, perhaps the question is, perhaps what the question is that, um, do we need the Buddha? Absolutely not. Of course not. We have the Dhamma. It's good enough. You can all get go away and get practice. The Buddha's done his job. So, you know, that's fine. But I think, I think perhaps the question is pointing to like the, the way that the Buddha's life provides like an example for us in how to live. Uh, and of course, from a Buddhist point of view, we've always kind of elevated the life of the Buddha and elevated the story of the Buddha and the idea of the Buddha as being uh, like uh, uh, an ideal of life. And life has changed since those days. And the way that we handle that ideal also has to change. Of course, over the years, uh, if you if you study Buddhist history, then of course, that story of the Buddha is told and retold. Uh, and with every every new generation will present it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, so for ourselves, you know, we have to, uh, you know, draw on what we know about the Buddha and the Buddha's life and find what meaning that there is for us in that. Um, you know, one of the things that's interesting, like to draw together the, 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 the Buddha's uh, renunciation and the environment and climate change. I mean, it's interesting that the, that in not in the suttas, but often in the traditions, that the Buddha was witnessed by the earth goddess when he went forth. And this is often like a very kind of beautiful image which is given of the earth goddess bearing witness to the the Bodhisattva's development of his Baramis and helping him to overcome and through through which is helping him to overcome the armies of Mara. Of course, that's not something we find in the canon. I'm sure that, you know, it's not meant to be a literal historical truth. But it's kind of interesting because it points to the fact that the Buddha's renunciation just depends on the earth, depends on the planet, depends on being able to sit on a seat of grass, depends on being able to walk to a village and go for arms round. And all of these things are part of what makes the Buddha's practice of awakening possible. Um, so I'm not sure, if, Neville, if that was what you were getting at, but if that's not, maybe you can uh, pop that in the chat. Uh, Samantha uh, asks, thank, says, thank you, Samantha, for a very interesting talk on renunciation. Well, um, my pleasure, Samantha. Uh, I'm very happy that you managed to enjoy it. And I'm just going to point out that when I when I do these kind of Zoom things and people say like thank you and so on in the chats, I always make a point of reading them out because I, mm. because we, this is like a mudita, 
uh, Murita for, for the talk and Murita for myself, right? So I should be happy that I've done that. So if somebody says, oh, that was a really good talk, then I always say, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a very good. <laughs> so I'm glad you enjoy it. So this, we, we, should, we should be proud of what we've done when we do something good. Anyway, that's why I do that. So how does this differ? How does renunciation differ from letting go or patinisaga? It might be incorrect spelling for Pali for letting go. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned before uh, to Don, then there are um, so many words in Pali having a similar meaning. And yes, the word you're giving there, patinisaga, it has a similar meaning of letting go. Uh, another word, pahana, also means letting go. Um, nisaga and many others. So these are um, these are. This is kind of in Pali. It's kind of interesting that the the the, the subject matters that Pali is interested in that it has a very broad usually has a very broad vocabulary in those areas. It's a bit like that story of Eskimos having a dozen words for ice or something like that, you know. So the suttas they talk, they have many words for meditation, have many words for um, like for the mind and contemplation, psychological qualities mm -hmm. and letting go. And so there are many words that yeah. express different aspects of letting go. In terms of like doctrinally, Bhaktinisaga is typically applied at a higher level. So that would be more for like letting go, um, uh, even, even for arahantship and kind of complete letting go of all defilements. So even though the word has a similar meaning, net karma tends to be used more as that like preliminary uh, stage of letting go and that's setting you out on the path, whereas patinisaga tends to be more used for that final stage of complete letting go. And I don't know if there's like a huge difference in meaning between the words, but that tends to be how they're used. All right, so Sujata asks, oh, Sujata's asking a spicy question. Uh, Bhante, talking of renunciation, I was wondering why the temples in Sri Lanka are short of monks. One reason could be there isn't enough renunciation as there should be in a Buddhist country. Just a thought that came to mind. Well, look, I can't really speak to that. Uh, I don't don't know too much about uh, situation in Sri Lanka with the sangha and so on. But yes, of course, this is a this is a challenge. It's the same uh, certainly in Thailand. Look, a lot of it is, you know, very very basically that people have more options, you know, as, as you know, economy grows and develops and people have more options for jobs and careers and things like that. Um, in the past, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, not everybody who was going to the monastery was really had a spiritual vocation. Uh, and sometimes it would be, you know, you just one of the children would be asked to go there or whatever, and you'd get an education, you'd have a place to stay. Um, and so, you know, you had a lot of sangha, but you didn't necessarily have uh, a whole lot of people who are really practicing. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing if there are fewer uh, monastics. The main thing is about the quality. The main thing is that, you know, whoever does want to go forth, then it's important that they should be sincere about it. That's, that's the, to me, is the, the main thing. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, Anoma. Thank you for an excellent talk, Bante. No worries, Anoma. I do my best. Uh, so I'll keep Nadisha's example in mind and will not throw a single grain of rice from now on. Are you sure? Are you sure you're going to keep that? That sounds like a a a um. That's a strong. That's a strong vow that you're taking there. So just just okay. Okay. Try. Maybe you say I will try not to throw away a single grain of rice. Might be better. Okay, so Neville said, oh, that, that my answer uh, covered the point that he asked, so that's good. Ravi says, once again, another excellent talk by Dhamma in his erudite scholarly way with metta and blessings to Bhante and all. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Well, that sounds pretty good. I can't really top that, so that sounds good. Um, I think we, we, ha we do have a little bit of extra time. Uh, and do we have any more questions while we have that the opportunity? Bhante, if I may say about the temples being not having enough bhikkhus, yes. we have bhikkhunis, but sadly right. they're not allowed into those temples. 
Well, this, of course, is, this is, is a problem, isn't it, right? Mm. And, uh, yes, the same, same thing uh, definitely in, in Thailand as well, uh, where, on the one hand, people seem to be um, have this kind of strange insistence on not having bikinis or dasil mata or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on the other, we'd rather keep the monasteries empty than <laughs> so actually using them. Um, yeah. I mean, from, from the beginning, really, um, from the beginning, the bhikkhuni order in, in Buddhism was an opportunity for women to live a meaningful life and a spiritual life and an opportunity which was even harder in those days than it is today. And if we look at uh, in the Pali Suttas, then there is not a, a whole lot of opportunities for women. Uh, most women, you know, would be expected to be wives and so on. Uh, and they're not really uh, a lot of professions. The only real uh, profession for women uh, was obviously the oldest profession uh, pursued by Ambapali and others as a sex worker. But apart from that, there doesn't seem to really be you know, that much professional opportunity for women. So to give that opportunity to become a bhikkhuni, to be supported, to get an education, to run the monasteries, to organize building projects, to take responsibility and to practice, that's a huge deal. And um, one that uh, I think that um, we should be taking the fullest advantage of today um, more than ever. Yeah. Bhante, I, I have another question for you. Um, would you like to tell us what yes. factors you thought about when you decided to renounce Bhante, if that is okay with you? <laughs> sure, of course. Um, what did I think about? Okay, well... Um, First of all, the hardest thing to give up was my guitar. Oh my goodness, I had I had really nice guitars, and I had to give give them all up. So that's you know I still I still think of them fondly. My my nineteen seventy two Sunburst Fender Telecaster and and uh, other. <laughs> um, but. Uh, Honestly, 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 it wasn't such a big deal for me. Um, people sometimes, because I used to, for those of you who don't know, I used to be a musician before I was a monk, but, uh, you know, people say, oh, it must have been very different being a musician and being a monk. And, well, yeah, in some ways it was, but in other ways, you know, there was quite a lot in common, one being that you never had any money. So that was pretty much, you know, I didn't really have a lot of money to give up. Um, and like... When I see, I, I I found Buddhism in Thailand, and when I so I'd already like left behind everything, you know. I'd left behind my girlfriend and my friends and the projects I was doing, things I was working on. I was intending to spend a year in Thailand, so I was already in that mindset of wanting to wanting to do something new. And in fact, I'd gone to Thailand precisely for that reason, because I'd felt that my life has, you know, I felt like I was at a dead end, that I needed to change something, that I needed to explore and find something new to do with my life. I didn't have the slightest clue what that would be. But um, I knew that I knew that it had to be something. So um, yeah, so this is this is that's how I ended up uh, in the monastery. So basically, to me, it was you know it was where I needed to be, and it was in that direction that I needed to go. So it wasn't really a hard choice or anything at that time, particularly. Yeah. So fun fact: when I, not many people know this. But I'll just tell you why not, because uh, fun fact, before I became a monk, I was in a monastery in Thailand, and no less than three of my former girlfriends came to the monastery before I ordained as a monk. <laughs> One came just to visit, others, two others came, they didn't even know I would be there, and they just show up and there's me, and uh, yeah, so there you go. 
that's my, that was that was that was my challenge that I had to uh, uh, overcome. Thank you, Lynn. But overall, if I got the message right, a sense of freedom, having taken a step, or yeah. one is getting drawn towards it, because Bhante's presentation was actually in line with what Don later said. Renunciation was not something focused on in the presentation as something dramatic and big, but right. small things. Yeah. Isn't it? So thank you yes. very much for that, uh, which we can sort of, it's interwoven into our lives, isn't it? Daily lives. Yeah. In a nice practical way. Yeah. That's very, very valuable to us, Pante. Mm. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Um, I'll just have a look. So just a few comments here. Uh, Analia says, uh, uh, Venerable Analia says, Sadhu to the Bhante and the organizers. Again, very thank you, very appreciated. Sudanta says, thank you Bhante for a thought provoking Dhamma talk. There is so much one can do to live both a simpler life and help the environment as well. Absolutely. And um, uh, yeah, you know, you know, I, I, before I was a monk, you know, I didn't, like I said, I was a musician. I didn't, I wasn't that wealthy, didn't have that much stuff and so on. But then when I went to the monastery, I had even less and I had like very little. And you just like staying in a little wooden hut. Uh, it's just some bamboo walls, a straw roof and a bowl, a straw mat for the, to lie down on, a cup. A spoon, a candle, and that's really just about it. And I'd never been happier in my whole life. And it didn't feel like renunciation or anything like that. It just felt like so free and so light. That's to me is why you know it's such a blessing to have been able to go forth and to be able to experience the blessings of the holy life like that. All right. So Samantha asks. Um, if the Buddha himself gave the blessings for the ordination of bhikkhunis and he himself ordained women, why or what is the reason for objection or different treat, uh, treatment of bhikkhunis now in this age? Oh my goodness, Samantha. Well, we are near the end of the talk. I could give quite a long Dhamma talk on that particular uh, detail, and I have indeed on many occasions, but I will just briefly address that. You know, one of the things about the Buddhist tradition, which is, I think, probably painfully obvious to all of us who participate in it, is that the Buddha was way in advance. He was like setting an example that was so far ahead of where most people are actually at and calling us to aspire to be there. And, you know, you can look at, at the way that the Buddha taught, the way he organized the Sangha, and there's so many things there that we really haven't yet caught up to in terms of, in terms of the, the, the transparency, the, the integrity, the simplicity, and the purity of what he was doing. So, yes, there are many ways in which the Buddhist traditions have fallen short of what the Buddha has aspired to. If you were to just point to one specific thing, I think the most important thing is what was alluded to a little bit beforehand, where people would prefer to have entry mon empty monasteries than to have bhikkhunis in them. And unfortunately, uh, the acquisition and control of real estate uh, ha is a huge priority for many people in their lives. And uh, that is often how these things are measured. Um, I think it's I think it's folly, uh, and I think that those monks who are um, opposing bhikkhuni ordination or not supporting bhikkhuni ordination have made a bad choice, uh, and I think that they need to uh, reconsider. And I think it's important that we um, keep our own sense of moral clarity about this. This is not a matter of trying to uh, attack anybody or trying to criticize anybody, but a matter of recognizing that. 
people, even senior monks, even senior orders or whatever, can make mistakes. It, it happens all the time. It's, it's okay, actually. It's quite normal. We all make mistakes. So we can change our minds and we can try to do something better. So, um, yeah, I hope that the Sangha will, you know, those, those monks who are opposing Bhikkhuni ordination, I do hope that they come to their senses and will change their mind. But meanwhile, um, I, you know, again, I can't speak too much to the situation in Sri Lanka, but I can, all I can say is that in, in Australia, since we ordained Bhikkhunis, we now have... In the Theravada tradition, we now have, I think, uh, six or seven places for bhikkhunis to live in Australia. And, you know, uh, was it now three full-size monasteries and a few smaller little hermitages as well? And that's amazing. That's a real difference since uh, 2008, 2009, when we did the, started with the ordinations. And we've made that difference and we've made that change. And I think that that's something to really celebrate. Uh, if I was to point to one, let me, let me, and I'm just going to point out one small detail that is mostly lost to history about how that change happened, okay? When Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Jagaro were originally invited to Perth to uh, set up Bodhinyana Monastery with the Buddhist Society of WA, there was always, from the beginning, an intention to provide uh, a space for nuns to practice. And if you go back and look at the early newsletters from the 1980s and early 90s, they actually had some nuns in Bodhinyana for a period of time. And there was always the intention to have a place there for the nuns to stay. That was part of their plan from the beginning. But at a certain point, the monks' monastery kind of grew up and there wasn't really a place for the nuns to have their monastery anymore. So it became the idea to have a separate place for the nuns' monastery. So they started a fund for a nun's monastery. This was in the mid-90s. They set up a stall. Every Friday night, people would come for the Dhamma talk and they put a little table and they'd have some cake and they would sell people some, you know, for donations, some, you know, a slice of cake, a couple of dollars for a donation. And that's what they did. We're raising money for a nun's monastery. One year, two years, three years, maybe 10 years they did that. And they'd raised a couple of thousand dollars and they kept on doing it. Yeah? And you could look at that and you could think, this is a bit crazy. You, you're never going to get the funds that you need to do that. And one day somebody came to Ajahn Brahm in the, in the Buddhist society, uh, a Western man. And he said to Ajahn Brahm, he said, Ajahn, I've just had my, I've just had my baby daughter has been born. And Ajahn Brahm was like, sadhu, 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 so happy for you. And he said, you know, I was thinking, maybe when she grows up, she'll want to be a nun. And if she, she need, wants to do that, she'll need to have a place to stay. So I'm going to offer the Buddhist Society $100,000 to make a nun's monastery. He came back the next week. He said, about that donation of $100,000, he said, I've, I was rethinking it. Ajahn Brahm's like, oh, no, he's going to take it back. And he said, he said, 100,000 isn't really enough for a nun's monastery. Here's another 100,000. So that's how they began seriously looking for a piece of land for making the nun's monastery. Yeah? So never think that it's not going to be possible. Yeah? Keep it going, keep the flame alive, and one day these things will happen. All right. That's a very positive note for us to end on, <laughs> I think. Very good. Should Thank we, you should very we much, Bhante. Some, some blessing chanting? Yes, please. Uh -huh. And thank you ever so much for an absolutely brilliant uh, session. Thank you. Okay, very good. Look, thank you so much. And thank you to the servants of the Buddha for um, uh, organizing this. Thanks to Deepika for putting us in touch and for all of those people who've contributed. Uh, and I see some of our friends from uh, Sydney, uh, Shanti and Sumana and some others who have uh, joined us today. And uh, I hope that this has been valuable for you. Um, and I'd like to finish. We can dedicate the uh, merit uh, of our practice uh, by doing the traditional chant of dedicating, uh, um, uh, uh, dedicating the merit. <clears throat> 
Akasatta jubumatta devanaga mahidnika punyang tang anumodan tu tirang rakan tu sasanang Akasatta jubumatta devanaga mahidnika punyang tang anumodan tu tirang rakan tu desanang Akasatta jubumatta devanaga mahidnika Punyang tang anumodan tu tirang rakan tu mang parang he tavata cham he sambhatang punya sampatang sabbe deva anumodan tu sab sampati sidhya he tavata cham he sambhatang punya sampadang sabbe bhuta anumodan tu sab sampati sidhya E tavata cha amhe sambhatang punya sampadang Sabe sata anumodantu sab sampati siddhiyati Adu sadu sadu Thank you Bhante, thank you ever so much We will then end this meeting Much merit to everybody who joined and most of all to Bhante and Deepika. We will then end this meeting. Okay. And let uh, all beings be well and happy. And we so, meet next week to listen to Aya Suvira, who also speaks okay. from Sydney. And her topic is she's going to speak on the Upalavanna Terigatas, explaining the verses of an awakened female chief disciple. So uh, that's the good for Very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.